Welcome to Charter California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz and we are joined by Mike Ramos. He is the DA for San Bernardino County and sir, uh, my sister's eldest is a freshman at UCSB. Oh, good. We're, we're very proud of good. her, Excellent. but this was a scary time. Yeah. Because as you know, there was a mass shooting at UCSB. Yes. She was at home for Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. Six people were, were killed, 13 wounded, 10 yeah. crime scenes. Yeah. It could have been CSUSB. It could right. have been UCR. It yes. could have been anywhere. It could have. Talk to me about your views on what happened in Isla Vista sure. over Memorial Day. Sure, and, and to those families that lost loved ones, you know, our condolences, right. and, and to us parents that have kids that have gone right. to college, in college, it's a scary situation. Uh, and it's a big issue. Uh, people need to continue to talk about this issue, the whole mental health issue. What are we doing not only locally in our state, but nationally on the issues of mental health? Uh, and the issues of gun control with those that are suffering from mental illness. What's remarkable to me is that a mere diagnosis right. of mental illness does not preclude the purchase of weapons. And again, I'm sure. not taking a position per sure. se. It's just intuitively one would think, yeah. huh, you know, if you've been diagnosed with a mental right. illness, why is it that you're allowed to buy weapons? Right. What's the rationale, the reasoning, as you understand? Well, I think they balance that, you know, our personal rights, our constitutional rights versus the government. And, you know, that's the always in, in safety and those issues. But I think we need to rethink that. I think we mm. may need to do some legislation. I think there should be an adjudication. Uh, if somebody is suffering from a, a diagnosed mental illness, right. they should go to a court. And, and, you know, we have the foundation for that. In, in our offices, we have our mental health courts. Uh, right. Both the adult, uh, excuse me, adult and juvenile uh, mental health courts. What about what we know as Laura's Law? Mm -hmm. I understand it's been adopted in just a couple of counties: right. Orange County, Nevada mm -hmm. County. I think your county may be looking at it. Right. And what Laura's Law would allow is a required mental health evaluation and treatment. Yeah, yeah. and I, I totally support that. And. Mm -hmm you should have them get that treatment required and then put it into our mental health court, a court of law, mm. and have a judge take a look at this in, in our partners there, or ourselves, the public defender's office, defense teams, uh, behavioral health, probation department, and really follow up and figure out, is this person, is it safe for this person to have a weapon, number one. Number two, what can we do to, to ensure that this person is gonna get the proper treatment and to the simple thing as continue to take their medication. Right. I mean, uh, those are things that society really, we have to take a look at this. This is a big issue. As you may know, an assembly woman, Nancy Skinner, has proposed a law which would create what's known as a gun violence restraining order. Mm -hmm. And what that law would allow, it's still a proposal, sure. for friends and family of an individual to contact law enforcement, presumably a DA's office, to right. indicate their fear that that individual could be a risk to themselves or others. Sure. And there would be an adjudication, sure. uh, presumably prosecuted right. by the DA's office, yeah. that would prevent that individual from buying weapons. Right. As we know, Elliot Roger was able to buy three, three. semi-automatic weapons. Mm -hmm. He had over 400 rounds. Right. What do you think about that proposed legislation? I like it. And we have mm -hmm. that uh, system in place. We have the temporary restraining order where you can go before it goes before a judge if it's an emergency in that mm -hmm. situation or a loved one or somebody that's tied to this individual. I don't even think it should have to be a family member and say, here's the right. situation, here's the mental illness, here's why we're concerned he, about his weapons. But as and I then, understand it, under current law, you could get a TRO, but would that create a 5150 situation where there would be an institu institutionalization or would I think that's a separate issue mm -hmm. because in those uh, there's different protocols for that and, and then you know as you know 5150 they go in for 72 hours. Right. No, this would just be to get the weapons, take the weapons and then can you in do that five now? days they go to a court and go before a judge. Now you can do that? If, if it, now you have to prove a threat, a threat to you, a threat to yourself. Uh -huh. so, but um, it needs to be cleaned up. We right. need legislation. Because this deals with a future purchase. That's what we need to work on. 
Absolutely. At the same time, there is a lot of focus on mental health. Yes. And I think that's important. But in the final analysis, only 4% of violence in the United States is perpetrated by those that are mentally ill. Right. Oftentimes, those incidents are very grand right. and very scary. Right. But is mental illness a red herring? No, and 4% and is a big number when you think about the type of crimes you just indicated. Very serious mm -hmm. and violent crimes where children are being murdered, where our youth, young people, are college students are being murdered. Uh, you can analogize that to death penalty case, 4%. Three strikers, 4%. Mm -hmm. But these are the violent people that we really need to make an effort to, to change the way we look at this, this whole dynamic. I, I do want to ask you about the optics and politics of this. Mm -hmm. If you look at the last 10, 15 years, and we just focus on school incidents, right. Jonesboro, Columbine, right. Virginia Tech, right. Newtown, and now Isla Vista, Santa Barbara, Sure. countless individuals murdered, mm -hmm. uh, injured, and yet we have not seen any serious gun control legislation on the federal level. We yeah. have on the state level. You know that Richard Martinez, the father of one of those killed, oh, was came out, I mean, yeah. a gun, forgive the cliche, guns a-blazing against the I saw NRA. That. I saw that. So, again, I'm not taking a position, but yeah. Is the NRA just so incredibly powerful that we can't get common, what some believe is common sense legislation? I think that if we sat at the table, even with NRA mem members mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. leaders, and we came up with a system, I think they would agree with us. They agree, if you talk to NRA members, that mm -hmm. people with mental health issues shouldn't be handling weapons. It's the system and how are we going to, to protect the Second Amendment rights, the things we talked about a second ago, mm -hmm. our private rights versus the government coming in and, and securing or making sure people are safe. I truly believe there's a balance that we could work with them. We shouldn't be fighting each right. other, whether you're an NRA member or not or support them. I think as a country, we should all be coming together. And I think that's a possibility. <laughs> I think about the parents of Elliot Roger, mm -hmm. who, from what I understand, really were trying to intervene mm -hmm. to prevent this tragedy. Yes. As you know, on the night of that fateful yeah. evening, they were driving up to Santa Barbara to try to prevent it. I know. Um, they had contacted the Santa Barbara County yeah. Sheriff's Department, who engaged in a wellness visit. Right. I think six or seven officers were there. Right. Mr. Roger, in his manifesto, talked about how he snowed them. Right. Which begs the question, are officers, are DAs properly trained to really ferret out those I can't. Are I can't risk? really respond for Santa Barbara. Right. I won't pretend to. But I think overall, generally, we can always do better. Uh, in training officers. I'll analogize it to human trafficking and, and training detectives and thousands we have in, in detecting human trafficking. But is it even fair? And it's working. But is it even fair to expect a police officer to be a mental health evaluator? I think they wear many hats now and it's got it's got to be part of their job. And some police departments have an expert police officer in mental health. Well, what about that? I mean... I think that's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. You train a detective or somebody that's excellent in mental health issues, that detective rolls out. Right. And he has all the expertise and training, uh, and, and the training is out there nationally. And that's what we need to do as a nation. I think we need it. What about, we know that the Santa Barbara Police Department did not do a check on Rogers to the extent to see if he was a gun owner. Right. If they had, they would have known he was a gun owner. Right. Is that something officers should be doing when they engage in wellness A specialized checks? detective, and I'm not criticizing I Santa understand. Barbara, because our officers right now, some of them are going call to call. Of course. They don't have time to sit down. And, but now in their cars, they have computers, they can check, right. they can look. And in a case like that, I think it's absolutely not only checking gun owners, I think it's checking the Facebook, social media, right. looking at all of that, and they would His have discovered YouTube channel that. was scary. There's exactly. No doubt about it. His name is Mike Ramos. He is the DA for San Bernardino County. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and you are watching Charter California Edition. What percentage of school shooters plan their attack in advance, as opposed to just snapping? 57, 71, 82, or 93 percent? According to the FBI, 93% of school assailants plan the attack well in advance, some for months or even years. 
It's California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer and Steve Adams is here. He is a member of the Riverside City Council. He is seeking a seat in the United States Congress and you are also a former police officer. Yeah. And so I want to speak with you about the recent incident at UC Santa Barbara on so many levels of your right. life, right. being a former police officer, city council, seeking a federal seat. Suffice it to say, it's a tragedy like none other. Right. Um, but what do you make of the incident and the background of the incident? The cops had seen this gentleman three times. What's your sense? I think that uh, if we look at all, several of these shootings, if not all of these shootings on campuses and, and in movie theaters, that there's a common thread of mental illness. Right. And back when I was a police officer uh, in the early 70s, and up until close to the 80s, we had a, the ability to deal with people that had mental illness problems. We could put them in on a 5150 hold, which is a 72-hour uh, observation. We could do that now, though, no? We can, but it's done very rarely right. now. It's, again, these, we're restricting the, uh, the confinement of people, even though there may be a threat or risk of threat but, to themselves or others. But let me ask you this. We know that recently, there were six or seven Santa Barbara County deputy sheriffs that went to the perpetrator's home right. as a result of a request of the parents, known as a welfare check. They ultimately determined there was no risk. We know there was. A lot of people are pointing fingers at these deputy sheriffs. My question, though, is they're deputy sheriffs. They're not mental health professionals. Right. Are we just asking too much? of our officers. I mean, how are they supposed to do an evaluation? And I'm saying that legitimately. Right. Well, it's very difficult. We uh, here in the city of Riverside actually get training from uh, mental health professionals to help try to observe the difference between drug, uh, right. drug influence or mental illness or other health conditions. But, but, but it's still. almost in, impossible. And what we try to do, and I think this is what we're gonna have to do, statewide, nationwide, right. is have available mental health professionals that when we get, they get a call like this, a safety check on right. somebody that they think the parents or friends or right. family think that they might be mentally disturbed right. or having a, a, a episode, to come out and help them evaluate. We send out right. P, uh, AMR, you know, the uh, paramedics sure. on medical oh. calls. Let's send out mental health experts. Let's have them on hand mobily so they can come out and help evaluate what the situation is. There is one point, though, that I do think is worthy of a legitimate conversation, and that mm -hmm. is the police could have done a check uh, through the state system to see if the perpetrator was a gun owner. We know he was. Right. We know he legally bought three guns. Uh, we know that he had a cache of guns in his apartment. The deputy sheriffs did not do that check. I don't know if that would have changed their calculation, but I think it could have been valuable information to know that he's a gun owner when they right. went there. And again, this goes back to our mental health laws and restrictions. We want, you know, gun, they have gun check, right. uh, background checks before right. you can buy a gun. Something in there needs to be legislated so that if you're under the, uh, the care of a doctor for mental illness and they perceive you as a possible threat to yourself right. or others, there should be some way to enter that into the system. What's fascinating, and I, and, I use that word specifically, yeah. is that under current California law, which has amongst the strictest gun control laws in the country, right. you cannot be prohibited from buying a gun simply because you've been diagnosed with a mental illness. You need to have been adju adjudicated or involuntarily um, institutionalized. Right. A mere diagnosis will not do it. Right. It, it, this is where we need to go towards legislation. One is we have to protect the privacy rights of, of all patients. That, that's a factor. You may have heard, and if you haven't, you know, let's just talk it through. Right. There is a measure that's being considered in California right now, and Assemblywoman from Northern California, Nancy Skinner, has proposed legislation which would create what's known as a gun violence restraining order. What it would do is it would allow family and friends or whomever to contact the authorities and say, I think that this individual uh, could be a risk to his, him or herself or others. I'd like the DA or whomever to investigate and if they find appropriate to seek a restraining order to prevent the purchase of weapons by that individual. I think it's uh, a possible start or a possible direction to go in 
or family members or friends. Right. Or therapists, maybe? Th a therapist, well, that's particularly tricky. That's a therapist. tricky with privacy. But, but can send an alert. Like the parents of this did. young they man, tried. they tried their best. They tried. And uh, yeah, tragically, it was, you know, right. they didn't get anything accomplished uh, to prevent that. But if you have that type of information, mm -hmm. there should be an evaluation process where they can come in and be evaluated. And again, we're, now we're talking about people's liberties, you know, search and, and seizure. And let me ask you about yeah. liberties because we're Americans, we revere the Constitution. Right. The Second Amendment, though, continues to be quite controversial. And I'm sure you heard that the father of one of those students killed lashed out specifically at the National Rifle Association. Right. And it, it's hard to deny that amongst a certain group of society, there's a lot of frustration right. toward the NRA, especially in bluer states like California. Right. Um, after the Newtown massacre in Connecticut, it seemed as if there would be stricter federal gun legislation. That didn't happen. I'm right. not taking a position. Right. I'm just wondering, you know, should you be successful in your run for Congress? What do you do if new legislation comes up to try to lim limit whatever that means, uh, gun rights, whatever that means? You know, when you're running as a Republican with, you know, and the Republican Party has strong ties to the NRA. Right. Well, I, uh, first, the father, I can't even imagine right. the loss of my child and how I would react. Mm -hmm. So I have nothing to say, but uh, my heart breaks for of him course. and his family. And so whatever his statement is, I'm sure it's heartfelt from this heartbreak tragedy. Right. Um, as far as gun owner rights, I think that's the same rights as your First Amendment right. That right protects your First Amendment right. That allows you to protect yourself and your family, your property. Uh, they talk about sporting. I don't sport, hunt, or mm. shoot, or any of those types of I things. Don't think but having been on both sides right. of the barrel of a gun, right. I can tell you that a citizen that is armed uh, can protect themselves, right. can't protect their families. I've been to the scenes where those people had weapons that could protect themselves and they survived, and I've been to scenes where those people had no way to protect themselves and they didn't. But think about this. The, in the United States, between the military and police, those two units have four million guns. U.S. citizens have 310 million guns. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, again, I'm not taking a position, but it is an interesting statistic to think that there are as almost as many guns in America as people. Right. And so, you know, we are a heavily armed society. It's pretty easy to buy a gun, even in California. Sure. And so, you know, it begs the question, you know, when you talk about the Second Amendment and the intent of the Founding Fathers, you know, was the intent of the Founding Fathers to allow uh, you know, a 22-year-old young man to have three semi-automatic weapons and 400 rounds of bullets. Well, I, uh, the intent, I believe, was to protect against external invaders, either right. domestic or foreign. You know, the only entity that can take away your liberty, your freedom, and your rights is government, whether right. it's domestic or foreign. The only thing that can prevent that is an armed citizenry. And you got to go back to World War II where the Japanese said, why did you stop here? Because they have 70 million guns and we don't have 70 million people to fight them. Because we won't be taken over that way, either by our own government or any other government. So I wouldn't take those rights away. But when you mention how many guns we have, we, this isn't even in the top 15 or 20 ways people are killed. If our real concern is stopping people being murdered or killed, Let's go to the number one through ten things that are causing Americans to be killed and correct those. Which one? Then let's alcohol go to the deaths, next ten. Alcohol Doctors, deaths. alcohol, yeah. cars, yeah. hammers, it's drugs. And so it's, let's go to, the, if, yeah, if we really care easy. about our people not getting killed or not being injured, let's go to the top ten things that are causing it, yeah. not the thing that we just are most yeah, visible. We don't and, and, and this tragedy the other day, mm -hmm. you know, he started with stabbing. Did some shooting, then started running people over. <laughs> His so name which is, is there you he's go. Steve Adams on Brad Palmer. It's California edition. What percentage of school assailants report having felt bullied, persecuted, and or threatened by others? 38, 59, 75, or 87 percent? According to the FBI, 75 percent of school shooters have felt bullied, persecuted, and or threatened by others. 
This is California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz, and we are joined by John McMahon. He is the sheriff in San Bernardino County. And so I want to speak with you about the recent tragedy at UCSB. And I want to speak about a very specific part of that tragedy. We know that six people were killed, 13 were wounded. But there's been a lot of talk about the fact that there were six or seven deputy sheriffs from Santa Barbara that did, that did a welfare check right. on the perpetrator. It's easy to point fingers. Why didn't they uncover the cache of weapons? Right. You've done welfare checks. I have. What's I a welfare have. check? You know, we, we oftentimes will get a call from a concerned citizen, family member, friend, to just go by and check on somebody to make sure they're okay. Right. For whatever reason, they've exhibited some behavior that may make them concerned to some degree or another. So we'll stop by the house, knock on the door, and visit with the person. And you, we have to remember that when we talk to them, it is just a brief moment in time. And, and we'll find out from them if they're a danger to themselves or a danger to others just by simply talking to them. And oftentimes that conversation is relatively short. Here's the challenge. We have a lot of folks that are engaging in Monday morning quarterbacking, and they mm -hmm. are saying, how could these six or seven deputy sheriffs not have seen that this individual was a danger to society? But I would presume that you are not a psychologist, Correct. nor are other deputy sheriffs psychologists, Correct. or MFTs, or MSWs, whatever right. it is. And right. so I question whether we're simply asking too much of our deputy sheriffs, of our police officers, to expect them to be evaluating the mental health of a citizen that they mm -hmm. see for a moment in time. Well, and that's a great question. And, and you know, our deputy sheriffs get training in the academy, as do deputy sheriffs across the state, to deal with those kinds of situations. But it's certainly not equivalent to a four-year, six-year, or eight-year right. degree in that particular field. So our deputy sheriffs, when they show up at a call like that, do the best they can to determine whether or not that person is a danger to themselves. And depending on how they react to the questions, and how they act to the deputy sheriffs. They rely on their training and experience, and they have to make a brief decision in a relatively short period of time as to what their condition is. So should it be that we should consider whether mental health professionals should go on welfare checks? I have no idea how many number of welfare checks that you department make, your department makes. So mm -hmm. is that proposal just ludicrous because there are so many welfare checks that could never happen? We couldn't have a psychologist on standby. Well, there's a number of welfare checks that occur in our county, but they're for a variety of reasons, not just the, the mental health I of see. somebody. It could be to, to check on the status of children at a house. Somebody's uh -huh. concerned the children might be abused. So that would be yeah, a different situation. Or an elderly person that they right. haven't heard from and doesn't answer the door. So they you would want not be to come a psychologist there, for example. Correct. So Correct. what do you think about the notion that maybe we should have mental health professionals on standby for these welfare checks? You know, query whether it would have helped. Right, you know, right. w with this situation, but right. is that something that we need? Because look, we keep hearing this refrain, it's not about guns, it's about mental health. Right. If that's true, and I right. don't know if it is, then let's focus on mental health. There were red flags in this situation. This kid had three encounters with police officers. Mm -hmm. His parents were calling. I mean, okay, so mental health. Put, put our money where our mouth is. Well, a significant problem for us is mental health issues. I mean, whether it be um, the jail population, whether it be the, the general public, I mean, we see a significant increase in those that are taking medication right. and have mental health related issues. We in our county do partner up with Department of Behavioral Health and their mental health staff mm. and help us do evaluations and help us with those that we think may be a danger to themselves and they'll take custody of them and try to get them help. So it's a significant challenge, absolutely. But to have somebody on call 24 hours a day I don't know that the budget will support that. Right. I want to talk about the future of mm -hmm. sheriff's departments, of police departments, and the future is no doubt technology. Absolutely. Uh, I have spoken with you, many of your colleagues, about my complete, I I'm baffled by the fact that we have seen crime statistics drop mm -hmm. during this economic downturn. And what I have heard from you and others is it could just be that it's technology that's helping law enforcement combat crime. Right. And so given that, talk to us about what your department is doing in terms of using technology to uh, be crime fighters. Yeah, that is a big step in the right direction for us. And we know that the resources are limited and the number of deputy sheriffs that we have out on the street is certainly limited. 
So our goal is to figure out a way to give our deputies the tools they need to be operate more efficiently and mm -hmm. effectively. Mm. The more time they have to be out on patrol looking for the bad guys, the better right. off we are. Right. And so we've adopted the Microsoft 365 platform. Tell us. Which is ultimately going to allow us to store all of the data that we collect in the cloud, which is something that's new for law enforcement. There's always been a reluctance to store data in the cloud because a lot of what we do is right. confidential. But now Microsoft has been able to comply with all the requirements from the government to store that data securely in the cloud. It's interesting. There has been one point of controversy regarding the welfare check in the Santa Barbara case, as you may or may not know. The officers did not look to see if this individual had uh, legal ownership of guns, which he did. He did have legal ownership right. of guns. It could be that they couldn't access that information easily because it wasn't in the cloud, right. for example. So. Right. You know, using that just as an example, would this help? Oh, absolutely. You know, we, we are going to a tablet from the old bulky computer right. inside the cars. The data will be at the fingertips of our deputy sheriffs. They'll be able to run in a variety of different databases all the information they need about the person that they're speaking to. So clearly that information is at their fingertips and makes it much easier for them to do their job. One of my favorite new tools for law enforcement is the automated license plate readers. Yes. I don't know if e all of us even know about this system, mm -hmm. but you know, Big Brother, I don't know, maybe, but it gets the bad guys. It does. So tell us about the license plate readers. It does, and, and we've, we've experimented with that in the Highland Station. But explain exactly how they work for us. It's huge. We have cameras mounted to the, the roofs of our police cars, as well as fixed locations throughout right. various cities. It tracks all the data from license plates, compares that data to databases as to whether the vehicle is lost, stolen, and if there's somebody that, that is wanted that could be in that vehicle. So literally, the officer is, a pass, is passive in this. Absolutely. It's just, if all of a sudden the officer drives by a car, the license plate or, or could spot it and just what, a, a notification comes up, get that car? Absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're alerted that that car is wanted for whatever reason. And, and the number of vehicles we've been able to recover that were stolen because of this system is absolutely incredible. It, and it works. It and works. And it has worked. Very, very well. I also want to ask about this notion of uh, our smartphones and how we can use our smartphones both as cit a citizenry and as law enforcement. I mean, mm -hmm. I got to think that smartphones have been incredibly beneficial. People can just start snapping pictures and... Sure. Talk to us about texting and how that can work. And right. It, it, that's a huge resource for us as well. And all of our deputy sheriffs carry smartphones. We don't issue them to them, but they carry their own. Mm. And they can take photos. And they can text back and forth to their partners. But more importantly, the new tablet that we're going to yeah, tell us has a tablets. camera installed in it. The deputy sheriff takes the camera inside the residence with them, can fill out the report on an electronic format. And then there's also the camera. They can take photos with that same tablet. All that is downloaded electronically into the cloud, stored in the cloud. We no longer will have to have people monitoring and maintaining our server rooms. Mm. We won't have to buy the new equipment to keep up with technology. It'll all be stored in an area outside of the state and much safer. When it Why? Uh, it's interesting. Why uh, is that for privacy protection? What's your sense? No, it's, it's more important that it's stored in an area that's safe, and it's redundant, and there's three different places in the country. Right, you and do have redundancy. Absolutely, and it's mm -hmm. outside of earthquakes and mm -hmm. that type of thing that we mm -hmm. experience in Southern California. Have individuals expressed concerns about the safety of that data? We hit on it a bit, but is there concern about the safety, the propriety, the privacy of it? Absolutely, there's always a concern, right. and, and this is something that's very new for law enforcement. Other organizations and, and private business have been doing it for a number sure. of years. But this is something that's new for law enforcement. It's an exciting time. Absolutely. No His name is John McMahon. He is the sheriff for San Bernardino County. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and you are watching Charter California Edition.